flow follows focus, right? The state can only show up when all of our attention is focused in the right here, right now. Evolution shaped what we now know of as 20. There are probably more, but we know of 20 triggers. These are things that drive attention into the present moment. And people who have extremely high flow lives, lots of flow in their life, the first thing they've done is they've sort of built their lives around these triggers. And the funny thing about them is, and I'll walk you through a bunch of them. Sure. The funny thing about them is none of them are complicated. None of them are super sexy. I'm Srini Rao, and this is the Unmistakable Creative Podcast, where you get a window into the stories and insights of the most innovative and creative minds who started movements, built thriving businesses, written best-selling books, and created insanely interesting art. For more, check out our 500-episode archive at unmistakablecreative.com. Stephen, welcome to the Unmistakable Creative. Thanks so much for taking the time to join us. Great to be here. Yeah. So, you know, I, uh, you know, have been familiar with, with your work for quite some time. We had you literally right back when we started the show, when your other book, Rise of Superman, came up. And I am a big fan of, of, of you know, all of your work. But part of the reason I wanted to bring you back this time uh, is, you know, people who are listening know that we are in the midst of our own launch for our own book, Unmistakable Why Only is Better Than Best. And you're one of the people that's actually featured in the book, um, specifically around the subject of flow. And I wanted to do a, a very deep dive into flow, how we create it, what the impact of it is. But before we get there, I want to ask you some uh, stories about your, you know, questions about your personal story. And I want to start with this question, which has been really informative and eye-opening. Um, what did your parents do for a living? And how did that impact the choices that you've ended up making with your life? <laughs> um, my parents, uh, my mom was a teacher. Um, and my father was a uh, he was an accountant, and he was an insurance salesman, and then he sold mutual funds um, and actually started out playing baseball. So what was the impact of those uh, careers on what you ended up doing? Like, how did that affect your choices? You know, what really affected my choices was the fact that my parents were really poor when, they, when I was born. And, like, their combined income was, you know, less than a couple thousand dollars a year. They were very young, and they had no clue how to raise a kid. And my mom compensated by reading to me everything and anything. So we'd come back from the library with stacks of books that were, you know, six feet high, which, you know, I wrote my first poem when I was four, which was weird because it took me a really long time to speak. Um, and they thought something was really wrong with me. But I wrote my first poem when I was four. And the only reason that could have happened is just massive exposure to kind of words. So I, like, I really think what helped me most and shaped me most is my parents had no clue what to do to raise a kid in their early 20s. And, you know, th their response was books. And I think the other thing, you know, I grew up in, in the Midwest. And what I saw from my father um, and, and when I came at me that way, and, and, and you talk to any Midwesterner, they'll tell you the same thing. Midwestern values, one way or another, are work hard and don't lie. Uh -huh. And I like those are those are pretty good values to start with. Um, so you know, I think from my mother, I got the love of language, and, and and really early on, I learned that books are where they keep the secrets, and which is you know the best lesson ever. Because if you're not you know a natural born genius, which I was not, you know. Books is the, are, the, are the only way you can get smart. Mm, I love that. Uh, you know, one thing that's really interesting to me about this is that you come from this environment, which really, in many ways, is not ideal to lead to the kind of outcomes that you've had in your life, like writing really, you know, like having a... a, a illustrious career as a writer, something that's sustained itself for many years. You said almost 28 years when, you know, right before we hit record. Um, so I, I'm curious, you know, having studied the people that you have through the work that you've done and the people that you've been exposed to, why do you think that certain people uh, become a product of their environment or a negative product of their environment and other people overcome their environments? And if, you know, like, how do you account for that difference? It's a really interesting question. And it's a broader question uh, to me than the way you asked it. And what I mean by that is, as a journalist, even as an author um, in my work at the Flow Genome Project, take your pick, you know, any, any incarnation of Stephen, 
uh, I was fascinated by people who are interested in taking on impossible challenges, right? So if, if we were talking about technology, I was interested in the people who were turning science fiction into science fact. And, you know, those were the people I profiled as a journalist for years and years and years. That was sort of one of my beats. And, you know, I was also interested in this, sort of the same questions in the arts. What does it take to make paradigm shifting music or, you know, literature, those sorts of things. So those questions always kind of fascinated me across the board and the and the and the thing that I that I have found and I and I don't know if there's a there's probably a bunch of answers to your questions, right? And access to flow is probably really high up there. But everybody I've met who's ever made a dent, to use Steve Jobs' word, uh, is ferocious. People who invented you know, Tomorrowland were ferocious about bringing the future into being. The athletes who kind of pushed kinesthetic possibility farther than ever before were ferocious about it. I don't mean they weren't playful or they didn't have a good time, but they were ferociously devoted to their vision and obstacles didn't matter. And I'll give you, let me, uh, let me put a context around that. I thought for a really long time that kind of my journey to writerdom was special, unique, interesting. I had a very difficult time coming up. I was, they nearly failed me my senior year because my poetry offended the school. I was thrown out of my creative writing program as an undergraduate. I was then sort of, sort of later invited back. Um, it took me, 17 publishers said no to my first book. It took me 11 years to write it. Um, there were, you know, there were a lot of those things. The job I spent 10 years getting at GQ, I got Lyme disease and spent three years in bed and lost the job. You know what I mean? And then the publishing market vanished. Um, and, you know, I, 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 I thought, oh, my God, I succeeded over crazy odds. And, you know, and this was blah, blah, blah. And I remember being at Singularity University and listening to Dan Barry give a lecture. And Dan Barry is a three-time space shuttle astronaut. And he uh, was a contestant on Survivor and did pretty well, by the way, and uh, runs a very large robotics company. And he was telling the story of his success. And in telling the story of his success, he was talking about the 17 or 18 times NASA rejected him. And it was, you know, just as funny and colorful and whatever as my story. And it was right at that time that I was sort of writing abundance. And we were going over a lot of Peter Diamandis' story. And I'd known Peter forever, but I, I was getting reacquainted with kind of his history. And I was like, his history matched Dan's history, matched my history. And so what I mean about ferocious is just... You wake up in the morning and you just have to do this thing, and that's what, and, that, and that's just it. And everything else is hogwash. That's what I've seen as the difference. Wow, um, I'm curious. You know, I mean, you mentioned that you, you've persisted through all this, and it's, it's funny because you're right. Like, if I were to go back and you look across 700 interviews that I've done here on the Unmistakable Creative. I can honestly say that sort of hero's journey and the redemption that comes after going through the crucible is kind of a part of every story. In fact, you know, I, I probably, you know, con unconsciously, I look for that in every single person that I interview. And if it's not there, I'm like, there's nothing here. There's nothing interesting. If you haven't gone through hell to, to get to where you're at, I'm like, what are we, how is this going to be riveting in any way at all? Why do you think certain people quit in the face of those odds? Uh, because not a well, lot of, let, there are a lot so of let, people. Let, 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 okay, so let's be really specific. Let's talk about, yeah. uh, let me give you a writing example. Okay. Um, though I've seen this happen to friends of mine, you know, in kind of every creative meeting, medium. But this is, so there, there, there are two early fail points for creatives. The first fail point is poverty, right? It is really hard to figure out how to get paid in any way that's sustainable doing this stuff. Right. In the beginning, for me, you know, it meant bartending till four in the morning, sleeping, you know, an hour and getting up and starting to work on my book because editors would start calling me at eight o'clock in the morning and I had to be ready for it. Um, and just not sleeping for five or six years. Right. Like that. Like, but everybody goes through that where you work in two, three jobs, you're doing whatever. And it, so that's the, the, the first whack of people are those people. And I also have discovered, by the way, people who come in with a trust fund or, or, or those things, they have another problem. They, like, they, they haven't had to work for it, so it's hard to take the criticism that comes from editors and whatever the thing, the relationships you have to make, they don't need them as badly. So they screw them. People who have money screw up those early relationships because they're not precious. Other people... They may honor those relationships, but they just can't hack it. They can't take the poverty for so long. So that, that phase one is that. 
Um, so your, your problem is either, you, you know, you're taking the easy road in and then it's really hard to accept the level of criticism that's kind of come your way or it's just too hard to pull it off. And at the same time that you're fighting that poverty battle, you actually have to develop your voice, right? Like you have to figure out who you are and what you can add to the creative conversation. And that's often a long process. That's easily, you know, 10, 20,000 hours of work to get there. And the trick is, what's so crazy is, you think, you, fervently, every creative I know, myself included, you know, just believes that you're going to get to a certain point, you'll get a certain level of recognition, status, whatever it is, where you actually get to be whoever you are. And I'll, I'm just going to tell you my story, what happened to me. Um, can we swear on your podcast? Oh, yeah. Go for it. Okay, good. All <laughs> right, then I can tell you exactly how it happened. So I, after I wrote, uh, after my first book had come out, so I was already a best-selling author, and I was on staff at GQ, and GQ in the 90s had assembled some of the best journalists in kind of the history of the world. It was like an all-star cast, and I was, you know, part of that all-star cast. I was sort of the last guy brought on to to GQ as a writer at large um, before the dot-com crash, and it was exactly where I wanted to be, and then I got Lyme disease, and I lost that job. And I bankrupted myself trying to find a cure. And I have two different novels, one that I was writing when I got sick and one that I tried to write while I was sick that are both sitting in drawers because they're nonsensical because I wrote them while I had Lyme disease. And I came out the other end and I had no journalism career and I'd lost my job and everything else. And I got a gig from Wired. And literally, when I was on staff at, at, at GQ, Art Cooper, kind of looked this great lion of journalism, he used to like love my stories. And if he didn't love the stories, he would call me up. He'd be like, okay, this is great. This is, this is fine. This is excellent. But, but where's that Stephen Kotler thing? So I was totally supported for my voice. This guy loved my voice, and it was awesome. And when I finally recovered from Lyme and my first job back, it was a gig with Wired. It was my first opportunity with them. And they, when they brought me in, my editor said, look, we, we want to do the kind of new journalism right, science writing you've been doing for GQ. We just want to do it here with our content a little bit more. And I got a first story assignment from them, and it was to cover this thing that went down in the Everglades. So I went down, and I lived in a freaking swamp with when recovering from Lyme disease. Months in a swamp was not you know, easy by any stretch of the imagination. And I came back, and I spent a couple months writing the story, and boy, did I need the paycheck. And I turned it in, and my editor called me up, and I, like I loved it. I thought it was the best thing ever. He called me up, and he said, Stephen, dude, I just got to tell you there's just one thing I don't understand. And I'm you know, super arrogant, thinking of it. Just one thing. I've got like one line and a paragraph to fix. Maybe I have to move a paragraph. Cool. It's a 5,000. Nice. Pay me. And, and I was like, yeah, Adam, what's that? He said, every motherfucking word you wrote. <laughs> he hated the entire thing. And I realized that I had a choice at that particular point in my life. Adam could have cared less about the Stephen Kotler thing or the best Stephen Kotler are. He wanted the best Wired story I could write. He didn't want me to be creative. He wanted me to write a Wired story. That was my job. That was what he hired me for. And I could do what most artists tend to do when faced with that, which is throw a fit, say this dude is stifling my creativity, I don't want to work with him, all those things get really arrogant. That is the natural inclination. You don't want to have to give in. But the second challenge in a creative's life is once you develop a voice and have a little bit of weight in this world, the second challenge always tends to be, great, now you've got to be creative for about a decade inside of other people's boxes. Mm -hmm. So the very thing that got you there isn't going to keep you there for the second transition. So people get kicked out early because it's too hard because of the poverty element. They kick, get kicked out the second time because they can't, they, they think it's about them and it's not. All they've gotten that first 10 years is the opportunity to play with the big boys for a little bit and nothing is guaranteed. Um, and it's usually more complicated than the next level up because editors, producers, directors, anybody you're dealing with has less time, less bandwidth, and is they're, they're being asked for greater results. So you're more on your own, and you have to do stuff that you've never done before. And it kicks a lot of people out. They feel stifled. They don't like it. And, you know, it, they, tend to, they tend to burn out, right? And you come through that, and then you start to actually get to work on your own stuff. 
but it's it at that point it's a you know that brings with it an entirely new set of problems right these are distinct stages in the careers of a creative they happen about 10 years apart and they're each big hurdles in their own right and you got to clear a lot of them and i think every kind of visionary activity every creative activity comes with those kind of built in sets of hurdles and my answer like why do you need to be super ferocious like for me, there was no other options. Like, if I didn't get up in the morning and write, I'm crazy. I'm unpleasant. I, like, I can't live. I can't survive. It's not a choice, right? It's exactly what I want to do, but it's not an option. So, you know, I have to find a way to make it work, no matter what. And if that's not the situation you're in, I'm not sure how to tell you to be successful. I'm sure there are a lot of other pathways, but everybody I know has come up with the same ferocity and is, you know, come up through the pinball machine. <clears throat> it's interesting that, you know, you brought up this idea that there, you know, for you, there's no other option, you know, and I kind of, I look at it this in a very similar way because I, may, I even opened my book by saying, you know, like most people, they go down a conventional path and they have average results. Like, you know, they, they manage to keep their jobs and do all these things at work. And like, I've been fired from every job I've been at. The results were abysmal. So I had no other option but to make it work. Like, I, I was like, the, you know, I, I, like, I saw nothing but dead ends if I were to do this the conventional way. And I was like, okay, you know what? Like, whatever it takes. Um, has just been my attitude towards the entire thing, the entire time, because, like I said, I didn't have average results. They were abysmal. I, and I also think, by the way, everything we're discussing, right, if you – we haven't talked about flow yet. Yeah. But everything we'll we're there. discussing is essentially a flow trigger. So this kind of creative desperation will lead you towards a high-flow life. So you will like you will have huge boosts along the way to your productivity because of that, especially if you're doing it in any kind of conscious, you know, way. I guess is, is what I'm trying to say. There, you're going to stumble into a high flow life, and you're going to get that boost. Right, work is going to become play, and 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 flow is going to show up and drive it all forward. Hmm. All right. So before we get there, um, you mentioned that there's been sort of multiple incarnations of your career. You know, like I, I've known you as an author. I know you do work on the Flow Genome Project. I mean, of course, you know, when I had Salim Ismail here from Singularity University, your name came up. So your name has come up in our show multiple times. And, you know, uh, I'm just curious what each incarnation has been of that work. And then um, we'll get right into Flow because that's what I want to spend the rest of our time talking about. You know, the, I, I, I always say I do six things in my life, and I've whittled it down to six things. One of them is writing. One of them is advancing flow science. They're kind of the same thing because I tend to write a lot about, you know, I either write about disruptive technology or I write about human capability and human performance. And usually I'm writing someplace where they intersect. Um, so it's, and, and this goes all the way back to my, you know, my first novel. Um, so I've sort of been circling the same topics my entire career. Um, and, you know, the research just built out of that. I started out interviewing neuroscientists about, you know, these topics. I ended up with a little bit of domain expertise, enough that the neuroscientists sort of said, hey, look, um, if you want to set up a flow research program, we'll, you know, we'll sort of back you on this. It led into kind of more serious research. So, you know, it, it's all it's all moved that way. I haven't stopped writing. You know what I mean? Like, I still do everything I've always done, and I do the Flow Genome Project on top of it, and I run an animal sanctuary on top of it, and, you know, those things. I just like keep away. I add another layer every 10 years or so. Yeah, I mean, it, it seems to me, I mean, at least when I, when I look back at the, all the people that I've interviewed, um, that there are multiple incarnations to what they do. They're not limited by any one label. Like, you know, maybe people think of them as, you know, an author. Like, I look at it now, I'm like, wow, even though I'm an author, like, we've produced an animated series, we've produced an event, you know, we've interviewed people. It's like we've done every weird imaginable thing. We're not just defined by this one thing that people kind of know us by. Well, it's also, I mean, let's not. You know, a lo somebody asked me recently for sort of a look at um, my full CV. Like they wanted to, they wanted to see the stuff in between the books, kind of thing. Uh -huh. And you know, yeah, there's like thousands, there's a couple thousand articles, there's ten books, there's also you know ad campaigns from like Taco Bell all the way up through like book campaigns, right? There's probably forty or fifty that I never have thought about the fact that I've written ad campaigns or marketing campaigns, but I've done tons of them as filler work along the way. Mm -hmm. um, there's a bunch of grants, things along, like the, the full list of like everything I've actually tried to write along the way is vastly bigger 
than just the stuff that the people see. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think that just speaks to, to the whole idea of cumulative output being uh, kind of the indicator of, of a thriving career. Like, you I mean, that, that's one of the conversations I had with Ryan Holiday. He said, you know, most people don't see the stuff in between. They only see sort of the highlights and the peaks. But ultimately, it's your cumulative output that matters. Ultimately, it's also like your cumulative output, like, you know, creatives like to work. That's just really what it is, right? We like be. I like the what it. One of the things that this is another derail point, by the way, and this is, I think, the mark of of kind of an actual creative in a weird way is, I for me a story. Let's say I'm writing a, a magazine article. It's done. My job is not to you know write a giant the best story I could possibly write. It's to please my editor. That's my job. Um, and so once that's done, I can get paid and get on to the next one, which means I have to have five ideas that are percolating, be writing five stories at once, and you know, all, I can't be attached to the outcome. I don't care what happens. Once my editor's pleased, I'm done. What it does out in the world doesn't matter to me. What I care about is, that, can I get that next creative project, please, because I want to wake up and start writing. Mm-hmm. So I don't know about you, but vacuuming is not one of those things that I ever look forward to doing. But as you know, your environment has a huge impact on your creativity. So I still like it to be clean wherever I'm living and working. But now it doesn't have to be something that you deal with. If you're like me and you grew up in the 80s, you probably fantasized about the day when cleaning your house would be like it was for the Jetsons, meaning you don't have to lift a finger. Well, the good news is that we're already kind of living in that future. And the easiest way to make sure your floors are clean every day is with the iRobot Roomba Robot vacuum. It cleans up after itself. The clean base automatic dirt disposal takes convenience to a new level, automatically empties its own bin into an allergen lock bag that holds 60 days of debris and traps 99% of pollen, mold, and dust mites so you can forget about vacuuming for months at a time. Let the Roomba clean for you instead. It learns your home, finds dirt, and empties itself on its own. It's got powerful cleaning performance made effortless. Remember, if it's not from iRobot, it's not a Roomba. To learn more, go to iRobot.com slash unmistakable. Well, I think that makes a, a perfect setup to uh, talk about, you know, what I want to spend the rest of our time talking about, because, you know, in my own research of, of talking to people, uh, you know, interviewing people, reading books like yours, reading books like Mastery, it seems like flow is this sort of precursor uh, to being able to achieve anything of great significance. It seems like it's essential for peak performance, like the two are inseparable. Uh, so I guess, you know, where I want to start really is by, you know, talking specifically about flow triggers, uh, And how we bring it into our lives on a more regular basis, because, you know, I think a lot of people, at least until you're, you know, like you you become consciously aware of it, they're like, oh, I found flow, but I don't know how to reproduce that on a regular basis because it just kind of happened. I think that is the core problem. Um, And by the way, ancient problem. Plato used it. Plato talked about the fast and slow path to wisdom. And it's the same, like you're looking the same dialectic. The fast path is I discovered this crazy altered state experience, a flow state experience, and I, don't, I have no idea how to get back there. Mm-hmm. And I think that's a very, very common. And, you know, the slow path is, hey, wait a minute, figure out how this works and how do I get back there? And, you know, the good news is over the past 25 years, neuroscience has been progressing so quickly. Cognitive psychology has been moving so quickly that we actually have real answers to that question for the first time, you know, in history. Mm-hmm. So what are the answers? <laughs> well, the, I mean, the short answer is flow follows focus, right? The state can only show up when all of our attention is focused in the right here, right now. Evolution shaped what we now know of as 20. There are probably more, but we know of 20 triggers. These are things that drive attention into the present moment. And people who have extremely high flow lives, lots of flow in their life, the first thing they've done is they've sort of built their lives around these triggers. And the funny thing about them is, and I'll walk you through a bunch of them. Sure. The funny thing about them is none of them are complicated. None of them are super sexy. Yeah. They're all really unbelievably obvious and underwhelming on a certain level. Um, (laughs) And you know all these things fundamentally because your body is actually hardwired for flow. It's hardwired to move in the direction of peak performance if you can learn to hear the signals correctly. Mm -hmm. Um, But so let's just talk about 
individual triggers. And you've got to think about these in terms of focus. Like the important thing is that these triggers drive focus into now. The first and most obvious one is passion and purpose. And people mystify these terms ad nauseum. They're crazy business buzzwords and they have lots of different meetings and there's lots of different ways you can break them down. But for this story, what's important is we pay more attention to those things that we believe in. It's just that simple, right? Like one of the reasons... It is so useful, we talked about it earlier, right, to like be able to do nothing else but be creative for a living is it's sort of, it, it's, it's passion and purpose, like, you know, amplified to the nth degree. You have to do it. You have to succeed with it. Um, there's, there's no other option. That's an incredibly powerful focusing mechanism. It drives a lot of flow. Risk is really critical along these, these lines. It doesn't have to be physical risk. I study spent a lot of time studying, you know, action and adventure sport athletes, and you see amazing amounts of physical risk, but it can be intellectual risk, psychological risk, emotional risk, creative risk, and it's totally subjective, right? Your risk threshold is not my risk threshold, is not a surfer like Laird Hamilton's risk threshold. They're at different levels. So all you got to do is meet your own, but risk is a, is, is a great trigger. Um, novelty is a phenomenal, phenomenal trigger. Complexity, unpredictability, those, those three, um, and, and, and again, all of them drive focus, right? And underneath that focus, what you're really seeing is kind of neurobiological activity, right? When all of the, a lot of these triggers drive norepinephrine and dopamine. Those are two performance-enhancing feel-good drugs that the brain produces, and they both massively enhance focus. So with you know, a lot of these triggers, what you're seeing is you know, these are things that are driving the brain into kind of better focusing brainwave states and releasing the neurochemicals we need to drive focus. And it kind of goes from there. And, you know, some of them, like, I'll give you a, a great example where people get this one wrong all the time. Clear goals is a flow trigger. And when people hear that, they hear the term goal and they ignore the term clear. We're very kind of goal-oriented here in, in Western culture. So, we, we, you know, we think about the end result. And that's not the point at all. If you think about the end result, the goal you're going to pull your attention out of the present moment. Clear goal means I got a list. I know what I'm doing right now, and I know what I'm doing immediately afterwards. I know where I'm at. I know what comes next. So I don't have to pull my attention out of the present moment and wonder. The minute you start pulling your attention out of the present moment, your prefrontal cortex starts to kick back in, your sense of self, those things, things that kick you out of flow, they start to resurface. So you don't want to give them the opportunity. So, you know, Peak performers surround themselves and their activities with with all of these triggers. Okay, wow, uh, that was just gold. So I have a couple of questions about this um, specifically because it's something that I, I've found in my own experience, and this is about technology, distractions, apps, all this other shit that kind of competes for our attention. Because you brought up focus and attention multiple times when you mentioned all of the flow triggers, and you know, right when you and I were uh, exchanging emails, I said I'm not usually on email until after 10 a.m. because it messes with my ability to stay in flow. And I've actually noticed this pattern pretty consistently because, you know, my next book is all about habits. I'm sitting here thinking, okay, like I can pinpoint exactly what produces flow on a regular basis. Like if I go through a routine of a thousand words in the morning, meditation and exercise, and then don't, you know, log into any weird social media services or Facebook or any of that, I get this sort of sustained creative state throughout the day. But the amazing thing is the moment I do that, it breaks and even if I, I do it just for like a minute, it breaks. So I, I'm very curious because, you know, Cal Newport wrote a book called Deep Work, which you may have read, uh, where he talked extensively about how this actually does a lot of damage to our ability to get into flow. And I'm, you know, based on your research, I'm really curious to hear kind of the role that technology, distractions, and all these other things in our lives play in all of this. So I'm going to come at it from both the front end and the back end. Okay. Uh, I got two answers for you. The first thing is, you know, when the Flow Genome Project goes into work with any organization, um, it doesn't matter. One of the first things that, you know, you are absolutely correct. I get up at 4 a.m. and I write from 4 a.m. till 8 a.m. No cell phone, no email, no Facebook, no Twitter, no anything, no phone calls. Um, it's, you know, absolute silence, absolute darkness. And, you know, I'll use that focus view. So all I'm literally looking at is a page of words. There's nothing else in my visual field. I, you know, put headphones in. I, and Ryan Holiday and I are the same on this. We tend to listen to the same soundtrack over and over. Mm -hmm. um, 
So, it, you know, it, it works the same way. So, like, you know, I spend four hours a day, you know, immersed in it. And then I have different, you know, different times. I pop back out for a little while, but I do this. I exercise at two different times in the day. Same thing, like long, intense focus section followed by exercise, you know, followed by food. And then I'll multitask for a little bit. And then I will nap and exercise and do another writing session and do an edit, you know, same thing you're doing. Um, Kind of, kind of kind of thing um and i think everybody you know and maslow found this you know way back when in the 50s when he was studying he was the one of the first studies of success and he was looking at the most successful people he could find and you know one of the things he discovered is they all used different kind of techniques what you what, you know albert einstein used to famously roll out into the middle of lake geneva and stare at the clouds right whatever they use these techniques to kind of shift their consciousness and bring on flow states and use that to drive creativity and most of them cut themselves off from the world to do it it's no different today right so you go into companies and we, we tell people that you can't like if your company policy is you have to respond to any email in 15 minutes and messages within two you're out of your mind <laughs> like you're going to lose to companies that don't do that. Like, you, I mean, it's just, it's that like the techniques, the, like the flow work that we're doing, we know from the McKinsey study that top executives in flow are about 500% more productive than out of flow. So if they get two days a week in flow, they're a thousand percent more productive than the competition. Those are really big numbers, yeah. right? And, you know, Salim, Ismail, who we, we, you mentioned, he's seeing similar things with his work with exponential organizations, right? That kind of level of, you know, that, that, that fast. This stuff is spreading through the business world. It's spreading through the creative world, right? Flow is, you know, being woven into lots and lots and lots of corporate strategies at this point, at, you know, at varying degrees and, and whatever. But those companies are just going to take off compared to, and everybody else is going to be left behind going, well, how is that even possible? One of the, well, they turned off the, you know, they gave people 90-minute blocks to concentrate in. It's the same thing Montessori education does. It's why one of the reasons Montessori education is such a high-flow environment. It's built around 90 to 120-minute blocks of uninterrupted concentration. Wow. So... Another question about this, uh, just based on uh, other work that I've done, and, and you know, I'm, I'm talking to Dave Asprey soon, so I, I kind of am curious uh, about the role that things like neuroenhancers, things like modafinil, and, and all of this play, and, and you know, what you've found in your own research about stuff like this. So I have my, I a lot of people come down all over the place in the answer to this question. My core belief is that we cannot yet measure all the neurochemicals in the brain, just neurochemicals, uh, that we'd want to measure to, say, build a biophysical-based flow detector. We have to use, rely on, you know, some downstream stuff and, and, and some ancillary stuff, and it's not very good, and it's sort of like, you know, testing for uh, water quality in California by taking a river sample in Colorado. And so all of the enhancers that we're looking at um, we can't get the kind of data we really want. Some of the other stuff, modafinil, Ritalin, Adderall, those things, those are interesting, and they are absolutely classified as cognitive-enhancing drugs. But interestingly, they don't seem that they boost norepinephrine, which will definitely make you more awake and alert, but it also increases anxiety levels and often can push you out of the sweet spot for flow, for really a deep, powerful flow state, it may feel like flow to some people, but in terms of lateral thinking ability and really kind of those wild creative aha insights, neurobiologically, those are harder to come by. So I don't think the cognitive enhancers are there yet. I think there are some technological solutions that are getting interesting um, along those lines, but I don't, I don't think any of this stuff is really ready for prime time, but I think you know, we're on the cusp of, of getting there. Okay, so you brought up technological solutions. So I, I want to talk about a few of those in detail. You know, you mentioned that you and Ryan, Ryan Holiday do the thing of listening to the same music track over and over again. So I, I for some reason, I can't listen to music with lyrics in it um, to do this. Like I have to do something like techno music. And I've been using a tool called Focus at Will, which I know Salim is a, a partner in. Um, I'm curious, you know, what are the technological tools that are playing a role in all of this? And then, you know, what about things like, you know, meditation and mindfulness? Like how did those play a role in our ability to create flow on a regular basis? I think there are all these things are you want 
to flow is a skill, right? And it's a skill at a really deep, it's training your brain to do a bunch of kind of odd, strange things um, when confronted with a certain kind of challenge. Um, and you need to know how to focus for that. Meditation is phenomenal focus training. And, the, you know, we, we like box breathing. Navy SEALs use it. And one of the reasons we like box breathing is not only is it a kind of easy way anybody can learn to meditate because it's got so many moving parts that like it will keep, you know, even a mind that's as, you know, chatty and busy as, as, as mine. My brain doesn't like to slow down at all. Um, it'll occupy enough of my brain space that I can meditate with it. And um, it also downregulates the nervous system. One, it's called box breathing because there's five, four sides to it. So you make a box with it. And one of the sides involves breathing all the air out of your lungs and then holding your breath for a five to seven seconds or whatever, that triggers a fight or flight response, usually up around seven seconds. Um, and so you have to, to perform this, you have to focus through that big fear response and stay in flow. Those are the kinds of things that kick you out of flow in, nor in normal life, right? You'll, you're working, you'll see an email come in, it'll, you'll get, catch a fragment, it's got a bit of emotional content, something that triggered a, re a fear reaction in you, it's a deadline you didn't remember, it's a whatever, and suddenly you're you can't focus anymore because you've had a panic, oh my God, is there something I'm forgetting response? Yourself gets kicked back into the equation, get knocked out of flow. But if you can learn to focus through that, you can bounce right back in. Mm -hmm. right? That's really what you see with top performers when you kind of use EEG to analyze their brainwaves. That's what they're doing. Um, they're being able to kind of get kicked out of that, their, their baseline state into, into kind of a high beta reaction. Um, and then they can drop back down immediately, right back into flow. But most of us just get pulled out. So there's one other question I have um, about this, and, and specifically this is around deliberate practice because I just finished uh, listening to the audio book of Anders Ericsson's book, Peak. Um, and you know, one of the things we, he talked about with deliberate practice is it's not just repetition. In fact, I got this even from your book where you know, you're kind of like – so for me, it has always been this habit of 1,000 words a day no matter what. And when I went back and looked through Rise of Superman again, I was like, oh, my God, I'm like, I'm actually limiting myself because I'm not pushing it to, you know, you mentioned this idea of 4% and 4% and 4% uh, day after day. And so I've been much more conscious of that lately in terms of trying to push past a thousand words, because I know that's my comfort zone. I can do that every day with no problem. So I, I, I'd love for you to, to um, expand on that just a little bit for, for people listening so they kind of get an idea of what that really is all about. So I, so you, you talked about a, a good chunk of it. I have different word counts for where I am in a book. When I'm first starting a book, sometimes a good day is 500 words. In the middle of a book, you know, it's 750 to 1,000, and then, you know, it's 2,000. Um, I also do a lot of back editing before I kind of start writing again. But anyways, I, I do try to move it up gradually, but that's not the only variable I play with. Um, I often find that, uh, for example, I'll just give you a very simple example. Um, I grew up in a, in a writing tradition where you, you really like, I don't know, like today's audiences, you, really, you have to spell things out a little more clearly than you used to have to do it. And I, was, I kind of grew up a different way. And for me to spell it out in the way that I, I need to, to really communicate with today's audience, I have to push my writing and push kind of like what I, the obviousness of what I'm doing past my comfort zone on a daily basis. I'm always a little uncomfortable with that particular aspect of my writing. But I know, you know, to communicate most effectively, this is what I have to do. Um, where It's where my natural instinct goes against kind of a, like a market demand. Um, so one of the things I know is if I'm not feeling a little uncomfortable about that on a daily basis, I'm not in my sweet spot for flow. And I'm not pushing hard enough. So some of it is word count, right? Some of it is um, the emotional triggers you have to look for along the way, right? Everybody, you know, that's my, one of my particular things. Um, I often don't know where the mainstream is. I live in the middle of nowhere, right? I run an animal sanctuary. I spend all my free time doing action sports. And, you know, that I don't have a ton of contact with the world, Um so it's very easy for me to kind of lose sight of where people are. And refinding that and weaving it into my writing can push me out of my comfort zone. I don't know if that makes sense to you, but yeah. like there's emotional bells as well. 
Um, and, you know, for, for example, when, we, when I was looking to, to do early research on this stuff, one of the things we did is we mapped all the jumps on a downhill mountain biking trail and, you know, how people felt about them. Like, how soon till they stopped riding around them? How soon until they actually thought they could clear that, like, all that stuff? And we, you know, tried to calibrate what's a 4% sweet spot from there. Very inexact science, right? This is not, there's nothing really rigorous about trying to find 4% other than that we have consistent data from a lot of performers over a long period of time. That that's sort of the sweet spot that seems to work, right? It's really, you got to, it's, all this stuff is an experiential experimental path. Uh. Okay, so that raises one sort of final question about this, uh, you know, subject, which is the role of, of food and diet and things like caffeine, like, you know, what role, because like, I can tell you, having just had a day where I had, you know, my so called cheat day, like I got to the end of the day on Sunday, I was like, wow, I had a lot of carbs today, I felt like complete shit by the end of the day, I was like, I don't feel like I normally do. And I noticed, you know, yesterday, total opposite. And, you know, uh, like by the end of the day, I felt completely different, like, you know, only one glass of wine, like all, all sorts of stuff around diet. So I'm curious um, what you found sort of the role that diet and fitness, diet and food specifically play in all of this ability to find flow on a regular basis. Fitness is huge. Like I you, you, you can soft pedal it. There's a lot of ways to get into flow that really don't require a lot of physical fitness, but over the long haul, if you really want to do this for a lifetime, for a career, you're going to need to get physical. There's no way around that. Diet is interesting. I don't have an answer for you. And when I say I don't have an answer for you is I kept a 10-year diet log based on skiing and flow states. I tried to ski 40, 50 times a winter, and I would record what I ate, how deep the flow state and looked for patterns just in my own self mm -hmm. with this one activity um, that, you know, and I get into flow pretty consistently while I ski, and I found absolutely no correlation. In fact, I found that more flow states showed up when I didn't have time to actually make breakfast. I was late, and I stopped at a truck stop and grabbed a burrito. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, yeah. sometimes the worst food produced the best performance, and I couldn't. So... A, my answer is I think it's very, very, very individual. Okay. I, for example, find that, you know, alcohol drinking will really keep me out of flow for a while. Like I, I you know, I, I can drink once and whatever, but like any kind of once I once I've gone past two drinks, um, two nights in a row. Yeah. Um, but anything like that, like forget about it. Like I've I, alcohol doesn't work for me. Other people. It works perfectly for them, and, and, and they've got some kind of relationship with alcohol that works. Um, <laughs> some people, you know, caffeine, I couldn't live without it. Sure. A lot of people think it's, you know, a lot of people don't, it's, it's not a good drug for them. Um, so I think it's totally individual. I think diet is totally individual. But I think there is no way around the fact that flow shows up when we're pushing ourselves, and those are high-energy states, and if not fueled up, and if the system isn't running well, you're screwed. So you're going to have like baseline good diet. You sounds like you're on the Tim Ferriss diet. You know what I mean? Like baseline degree, healthy yeah. diet. <laughs> I could, Tim's diet didn't work for me. Yeah. Um, I, I for can't a do lot the, of the other reasons. Like after the cheat day, yeah. the day after the cheat day, I was worthless. I like, I, <laughs> yeah. I might as well have gone out and done 17 different drugs yeah. the night before. Like I'm so worthless based on all the crap that I put in my system at his cheat day. Like, it was. It didn't work for me at all. I like. I don't know how Tim does that, but it works for him. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. No. I. I. You know, being Indian, completely kicking carbs is kind of like you know a, a diet a diet of starvation. <laughs> like, it's right. just not it's, really it's possible. True. Like, I can eliminate them for a couple meals a day, but like you know, at least once a day, it's just kind of part of a part of my my you know diet that I've been raised on. So, um, okay. Final. A couple of final questions. Uh, you know, uh, this is another one. What uh, book? piece of music or documentary film, uh, you know, and you can name one of each, uh, have profoundly influenced your life that you'd recommend that somebody in our audience should pick up? Well, um, I, I recommend, uh, I have three books and it just depends on what you're interested in. If you like environmental stuff and evolutionary theory, and I think if you plan on being smart in this world, you need to understand evolutionary theory. I don't think science makes sense without that foundational piece. And the coolest 
neatest way to learn it and also understand why the current environmental crisis is so devastating is David Quammen's Song of the Dodo. Love that book. I'm really big on a book called The Origins of Wealth, which is a complexity science, science, science-based look at the economy and capitalism that is, I think, really stunning. And for kind of consciousness and neuroscience and all that stuff, there's a book called The User Illusion by Torney Anderson, who's sort of like the Carl Sagan of Denmark-ish. Um, and it's really about consciousness and how, you know, how powerful or not powerful or limited the conscious mind really is. Um, and I just think it's a, it's a fun, it was written back in the 90s. So, you know, we've updated a lot of that research. But I just think it's a foundational book that's just wonderful. So those are my three books. Awesome. Well, uh, I have one last question for you, which is how we finish all our interviews with the Unmistakable Creative. What do you think it is that makes somebody or something unmistakable? So uh, my answer is perspective, which I would define as like the combination of voice and courage. Hmm. I think, um, like, I don't, you know, all, you know, all we, all, all we are, you know, one way or another at a deep metaphysical crazy level is the universe asking itself a question about itself. We're a particular, you know, does this particular living strategy work from an evolutionary perspective? All that comes down to is we're a perspective. And so what makes something unmistakable is you're, you're a perspective. Nobody is ever going to get to be you again or, you know, look through these filters and have this interpretation of the world. So, you know, you, you, you need to honor that and bring it into, bring it on, onto the planet because nobody else gets to have that perspective. You, you, it, it's yours or own. And it's, it's the one thing we know, all metaphysics aside, that you can actually contribute. Hmm. I love that. So... Wow. I, you know, it was a it was a very strange answer to your question, but I think it's, <laughs> <laughs> that's what I got for you today. <laughs> yeah. no, no. Well, this has been just phenomenal and uh, fascinating. Where can people learn more about your work? StephenCotler.com or the Flow Genome Project.com. Awesome. And for everybody listening, we will wrap the show with that. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Unmistakable Creative Podcast. While you were listening, were there any moments you found fascinating, inspiring? instructive, maybe even heartwarming. Can you think of anyone, a friend or a family member who would appreciate this moment? If so, take a second and share today's episode with that one person because good ideas and messages are meant to be shared.